So you have a report, the Center for American Progress, a 100% clean future. It calls for spending a lot of money to do a lot of things to get to this 100% mm -hmm. clean future by 2050, I think it is, isn't that yes. right? Yes. 2050. Um, one of the issues you raise, which is very interesting in here too, which also we hear on the campaign trail a lot, is in the area of environmental justice. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the report says, and I'm quoting from it now, people of all communities need to see the benefits of climate action in their own lives and have a voice in shaping their future. How does environmental justice work as an issue? Who does that get out to vote? I think environmental justice is first the right thing to do <laughs> because environmental justice is really about ensuring that people, regardless of their race or their income, um, are the beneficiaries of climate action, not bearing the burden of climate action. And we should be clear that in a lot of environmental actions over a long period of time, we've often uh, forgotten the needs of communities that are urban, that are made up disproportionately of people of color, of native communities. And I actually think that uh, we can bring about a new constituencies who, can, who see, can see climate action as a part of the solution for their communities. And, you know, a truth, honestly, that may mobilize the base of the Democratic Party, but it is an important uh, constituency for us to think about. It, it brings us to the first question that we've got from uh, a student mm -hmm. um, in the Planet Forward orbit, if I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> Rohan Agrawal, he's at the University of Mississippi, and his question is about a climate change in a skeptical public. So let's mm -hmm. take a look. Hello, my name is Rohan Agrawal, and today I want to ask, considering that there are so many academic resources available on climate change, how do we ensure that that information reaches a people who are skeptical about the effects of climate change? How do we shift the public discourse from debating about climate change to having a more informed discussion about its effects and consequences on people and the community? So how to make it a more informed conversation, I'd add there, how do you get the science to, mm -hmm. to, to, to people, or should candidates not invoke the science because science is scary and the word scares people off? I, I, I think science is not really scary to the majority of Americans. I'm, I'm hoping to, that we could be like that optimistic <laughs> that uh, just the basic science is still, I, I, think, I think this is a really important issue, which is often we think because a lot in the media will focus on the base of the Republican Party and people talk about, you know, Trump voters and people who are in diners in the Midwest <laughs> and their views. And uh, it's easy to talk about people who've really formed their world vision from what they hear from a certain media outlet or the president's Twitter account. But we should be clear that uh, support for action on climate is growing. It is a strong majority. Support for re-entering the Paris Agreement, which is not sufficient, but re-entering the Paris Agreement is over 60% of the country. That independent voters uh, are growing in their support, but a strong majority of independent voters see climate action as really a no-brainer. They think climate change is happening and that it isn't, um, that it isn't something to be dismissed. And so I think we have a highly polarized debate we have a highly polarized debate across the board. Um, but that the polarization on climate is not that different from the polarization on healthcare or other issues. And we just have to break through it. We're I mean, a pretty, there's a pretty polarized place right now. The whole country is really polarized. But what, what's what's good, I, I look at a lot of issues. What's what we should what's what we should note about climate is how significantly it's moving and how more pe a strong majority of Americans want the next president to take actions on climate. There, there are worries they have. They don't, you know, we should be mindful. They don't want to lose jobs and they worry about taxes. So we have to have a, an adult conversation about how we can do this. But and, and the way that adult conversation is going to get, 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 get engaged during the campaign is going to be, you know, with fists flying. And, the, and, and, and yes. Donald Trump and the Republicans will say that the Green New Deal, which is at one extreme of, of your mm -hmm. party, mm -hmm. and you've got, you've got a, a wide range of climate plans amongst the candidates, the presidential candidates, mm -hmm. from uh, a sort of incremental approach to the, the, the full-fledged Green New Deal. They're going to say it's going to cause uh, high cost, high taxes, more regulations, that's a job killer. Um, do you worry uh, that like health care, the, the left of the party um, could scare people? 
and climate. Well, I'm a Democrat, so I worry about everything. But, um, <laughs> uh, and you know, uh, history, As you should. history has proven me right on occasion. But um, I, I, I think, I think the thing is, uh, you know, I, I think if you look at what happened, what's happened over the last couple of years, um, the way to think about these things is the president is going to attack and attack viciously on a whole series of areas. And some, some issues they can gain salience on and some they can't. So I'll give a great example, which is I, in the 2018 campaign, we had lots of, there were lots of Democratic candidates running in districts that lean Republican. Um, and in almost all of those districts, the candidates supported uh, the ACA and uh, strengthening the Affordable Care Act and, uh, and supported um, comprehensive immigration reform. You know, two kind of touch, you know, important issues. Uh, the Republicans ran ads against them, I mean, almost universally, that they supported, they attacked them on single payer and open borders. And the candidates responded saying, I oppose single payer, but I support uh, the ACA or covering everybody. And, and lots of candidates ran ads saying, I support strong borders, but I want comprehensive immigration reform. And most of those candidates won. You know, I don't believe you cannot talk about salient issues and an issue like climate change just to say, I mean, I think most people understand this, but just to say, if the United States does not act in 2021, we are setting the planet back. We are we are relegating our children. So we, we have to just decide to do this. Let me, let me, but let me just say one quick thing in sure. response to this, which is I think it matters where the candidates stand. If a candidate has a plan that can be, you know, easily characterized as destroying millions of jobs, that is going to be a problem. But if a candidate has put forward a plan, and you know, I I would argue our plan does this, puts forward a comprehensive plan that invests and provides lots of <laughs> provides a makes the climate issue one in which is a job creator to people, I think you can let through those attacks from Donald Trump. And I think you, the, confidence voter, the confidence candidates have is an important one in that debate. Um, here at, uh, in our School of Media and Public Affairs, one of the things we study in political communication is framing. Mm -hmm. you know, how issues are framed to the public. Yes, it has to be framed as so an what economic is the, positive. So that's what I was going to ask. Yeah. What, so w the, the, is that... It's not the doomsday. It's not the, the world that your, your you know, the, the, the gloomy world that your kids are going to live in. It's not um, the, the, the climate emergency that we call it. It's got to be wrapped around these are all the jobs that we're going to create. I think it, it really, I think actually we don't give voters enough, uh, enough credit for being able to understand two concepts. One is we have to act. There is a climate emergency. You can see that climate emergency from the things you see in the world around you. Right, voters, voters all around this country see superstorms and droughts and wildfires, and they think the world is changing around them, and they want leaders to do something about it. But the the optimistic message and the and the and the accurate optimistic message is to say, we at this moment in time are better equipped to make the climate solutions we need to take on an economic win for the country, for your state for your community and your family than ever before. Uh -huh. We have more evidence of that. And by making these investments, we can both save the planet and improve our economy as w we go. What's really remarkable about the, the climate issue is how how intensely it gets pol politicized and how much of that kind of thing gets lost. You know, at the, in yeah. Planet Forward, we have students who are looking at these inventors and the innovators who are exactly. doing incredible things. Um, and you know, it's it's just as the technology has changed, and we can drill down seven miles, ten miles, and get oil. So we have I mean, incredible technology that in solar and wind that's made leaps and bounds, and is so much cheaper. But and also, I mean, that's an important point, which is just think about. I mean, I know that it's easy to become incredibly pessimistic, being when you look around at some of these problems. Well, the but clock think is ticking. But, the, but think of the areas of optimism. I mean, just how much solar has reduced, how much solar, the price of solar is, is it's so much cheaper than it used to be. It's so much better. And Ronald Reagan was called the sunny optimist. Do Democratic <laughs> climate candidates have to be climate optimists? 
I would argue that you should tell an optimistic story about how this can be an area in which the United States helps its economy, helps lead the world, takes an industry that will be a global industry because of the nature of the problem and can win it, can, can be a leader in it. And I would just say one final thing. We talk a lot about lost jobs in lost areas of the country and the challenges around manufacturing. There's example after example around the world of how countries, particularly the Nordic countries, just as an example, have shifted their economies that were focused on manufacturing and move those people into jobs around renewable energy, addressing the climate crisis in good paying jobs with very little disruption. You know, we have to think strategically about doing these things again, but some of the challenges we see in our society we could actually address if we had a concerted strategy on this.